I mostly write science fiction or speculative fiction, speculative history, because there are so many elements to the story that I just want to include. Cautionary aspects, probing at the effects that change has on human beings and our societies. But there's also the opportunity to do, engage in world building, to create a near future in all of its texture, its warp and its weft. And yet in such a way that the characters take it for granted because they're not people from 2012 or 2013 transported to that time. They are people who lived all the intervening years or were born into that time. And they take it for granted. To convey that, that's a literary challenge. If you want to test your ability as a writer, to keep the action and interest and intellect and empathy all going at the same time while building a world and dealing with ideas and issues, I think you're pretty much behooved to write science fiction. We science fiction authors we poke at the universe using these prefrontal lobes. And we know that this is the seat of the thought experiment where people think about the future because people who've had prefrontal lobotomies snipped, they lose interest in the future. They remain intelligent. They just lose interest in doing the thought experiment. And it may be that some of our fellow citizens have been effectively prefrontal lobotomized because they have no interest in the future in performing thought experiments about the consequences of our trends. The point is that as a futurist, it's my job to stimulate the exercise of these organs that the Bible may have referred to in speaking of Moses as having lamps on his brow. An interesting reference. The near future is difficult territory for science fiction. The most difficult time range is 30 to 50 years. Because if you think about it, what would your own self, if you could bring that person forward from 30 to 50 years ago, say if you took him or her on a tour of today's world? Half the time it would be, wow, we never thought of that. And the other half it would be, you mean you're still doing that? That blend of surprising progress and stunningly obstinate refusal to change. That's human nature. And you would have had that same surprise all across the Western Enlightenment, especially the last few generations of Americans. So if you're extrapolating forward, to the year 2045, as I do in existence. Or when in 1988, I went 50 years forward in my novel, Earth. It's the most difficult. But we need to remember that a science fiction author doesn't try to predict the future. Oh, he may brag about his predictive score that his fans are keeping track of. But the fact of the matter is that's secondary. You're trying to explore the future. You're trying to probe the future. You're trying to warn, perhaps. In fact, arguably the greatest type of science fiction novel, a, a, a level achieved only by a few, by Orwell in 1984, by my friend Ray Bradbury in Fahrenheit 451, is the self-preventing prophecy. 
The prophecy that so disturbs its readers, that millions gird themselves for the rest of their lives to watch out for that failure mode and to devote some of their life effort to preventing it from coming true. The cautionary strain in science fiction doesn't have to lead automatically to a dystopia. H.G. Uh, Wells in The War in the Air and Things to Come warned of terrible uh, lethal events if this goes on, if things went on. Wells I consider to be a kindred spirit because he was contrarian. Whenever he was around optimists, he was wagging his finger. Whenever he was around cynics, he was talking about the possibility, the possibility that we might be able to get our act together. I suppose my biggest cautionary tale would be The Postman because it portrays terrible mistakes having led to the fall of civilization. That turns out not to be permanent. The forces of civilization, nostalgia for what we had lost, rise up enough so that we get civilization back. Well, I'm accused of being too incredibly optimistic for that. But I succeeded at getting my cautionary point across. After that, what service do you do by then saying, you idiot humans, you'll make this mistake and it'll be lost forever. As opposed to foolish people in this story, not enough of you were sensible. Not enough of you negotiated. Here's what happens. Here's how what you might climb out. Ray Bradbury, the one thing that made him angry above all else, and this is a man who plumbed the deepest, darkest corners of the human soul, was cynicism was despair, was pessimism. That is what made him angry. And if we remain obsessed with the past or doom and gloom, and I'm teaching the choir here, then we're betraying Ray and we're betraying poor George Washington and Adam Smith and all the other heroes. I don't like being herded with a crowd in a particular direction. The crowd is all running towards cynicism right now. I know how horrible human beings are. And hence, I must look at the progress we have made with astonishment and feel forced to be loyal to whatever it is that's making this progress.